people with Asperger's tend to be just a, a heck of a lot brighter than the rest of us. Is, is that sort of a characteristic of Asperger's? Of the high functioning Asperger's, yes. And they, they tend to be really good at one thing and terrible at almost everything else. Really? Yeah. Now, what was life like for you as a child? I knew that I had an issue when I got into grade one because I was failing all my courses and uh, I couldn't hold a pencil. I was frustrated because I couldn't make numbers, I couldn't make letters, and I wasn't talking. Uh, but there was a teacher that held me after school about five weeks before the end of the school year. And she said, I'm going to ask you questions about these books. You don't have to say a word. Just nod your head or shake your head. She figured out I, I could read. So she says, I'm going to pass you into the second grade. Now, were you talking at this time? Well, I knew a couple of words. My parents said I knew three words, yes, no, and cookie. And you can get pretty far with those three <laughs> words. <laughs> but were you understanding language? Oh, I knew everything. The problem is when you're on the spectrum is that it's so easy to offend people by what you say. And I would get disciplined for that. So I figured out if I'm going to survive, I better keep my mouth shut. So it's not that I didn't understand. Uh, I could talk, but I wouldn't talk because when I talked, I got into trouble. Now, when you get into grade one like this and, and you have this, this uh, spectrum issue, uh, kids can be brutal. They were. Oh, were. Were you bullied? Definitely, yes. And, and, and how did you cope with that? Stayed away from the bullies as much as I could. So Was, was there any kid in school who, in, in that first year who, who, who befriended you? Who treated you kindly? Uh, not really, but uh, there was that one teacher. The teacher. And I only had her for six weeks. I found out 30 years later that she, she was a Christian. Mm. And she started praying for me. She followed my career. I mean, my wife and I visited her uh, when we were in our 30s. She had newspaper clippings of me. And when she said it, says, I couldn't figure you out. Uh, but I knew something was going on. So... Grade two, grade three, grade four. When, when was it that you began to emerge, at least, uh, and, and communicate and, and start, even in the most rudimentary fashion, to socially engage? It was grade two because in Canada at that time, where you sat in the classroom was based on your academic standing. I was in the last chair, and all the kids were saying, that's the dummy back there. So I made up my mind I was not going to stay in that last chair. So I would go home from school and practice holding a pencil for hours at a time. And eventually I could actually make numbers and make letters. So I could prove I could, you know. Why, why the issue in holding a pencil? Well, the, often people on the spectrum have a problem with fine motor skills. And so I realized I had a problem. The other kids were doing fine with a pencil. I couldn't. So I just kept practicing and practicing until I could do it. And then I realized I've got to start talking. Even if I'm going to be offensive, I've got to start talking because I'm not going to make it if I don't start talking. Now, are you being coached? Like, uh, no. Th this is a, an internal conversation going on here. It's an internal conversation going on, but I said, I do not want to be in that last why, why, chair. Why do you suppose you chose to be proactive rather than reactive? I mean, you, you could have done, uh, done what a lot of kids on the spectrum do, is just basically retreat and, and, and form a shell and never come out. Well, I did some of that. My parents were worried that I just spent all my time in my room and we had one book and I was reading that one book. But when I was in grade two, our teacher took us to the public library. And so I would actually uh, borrow, you know, get bus fare from my parents. And every Saturday I would go to the Vancouver Public Library and come home with five books on astronomy and physics. So Really? Yeah. And every week I would read five books. On that, on those How subject old matter. at this point? I was seven. Seven, you're reading astronomy and physics? Correct. Did your parents clue in, this kid is brilliant? They, they told me they knew I was brilliant by the, from the time I was two years of age. Because they said they watched me doing science experiments without any motivation starting at age two. At age two? At age two. And so they said, and I wasn't talking, but they said, we know something's going on there. Did you, as you got older, and you know, social interaction becomes more and more important, especially as you're approaching your teenage years, did you begin to doubt yourself, question yourself, saying, I I'm being bullied for a reason, there is something wrong with me? Well, I knew I had handicaps, and I knew I was never going to be well-coordinated physically, and therefore I was doing terrible at sports. But I said, I'm going to compensate. I'm going to get into great physical shape. So I would walk 40 miles a day. Uh, you know, climb mountains uh, from my home uh, 
in Vancouver, uh, just on foot. I didn't have bus fare, so I had to do it on foot. Got myself into really good physical condition, and that was a, a compensator for me for my lack of coordination. So I was able to do sports just because I could run, you know, 90 minutes nonstop. So you, I, I, went, I went into soccer and rugby because I could, you know, I could go the whole time. When, when did you break through, if you will, to the point where you were at least um, socially capable? That took a lot longer. Uh, what helped is that I was going into astronomy and physics, and that seems to be a discipline that attracts a lot of people on the spectrum. And so I was with a lot of people, and we all thought we were normal. The rest of the world was weird, but we were normal. Right. So, and the, the, the high school I went to was filled with refugees from other countries, and so they were learning how to speak English. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I was having language issues uh, was not a, not a problem. Did you uh, meet other uh, kids on the spectrum? No. As far as I know, I didn't. So you, you, you were a minority of one. Now, when I got to uh, university, I met some because I was now seriously studying astronomy. And yes, a lot of my peers uh, were clearly on the spectrum. And now you're married. You've been married for 34, 35 years. But it's a miracle I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> we should have your wife, Kathy, on here and just kind of get some affirmation. But uh, tell me, I mean, how did that happen? How did you, how did you decide on her and, and how did you proceed when you didn't really know what to do? Well, I was interested in her and wanted to form a relationship with her, but it took about 18 months before anything actually happened. And you know, I was trying to indicate my interest, but I was getting absolutely nowhere. Did she know that you were on the spectrum? She didn't. Uh, and uh, she was interested in me, but I wasn't picking up the signals. What was it about you that interested her? Your fitness? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was my commitment to, uh, to scripture and Christianity and evangelism. She saw me a passion to see people come to Christ. She also saw that I was willing to be coached on how to socially interact with people so they could come to Christ. And you know, that's something that's encouraging. Everybody I know who's on the spectrum, who's high functioning, can gain the social skills if they're willing to work on it. Right. And it's going to take years, it's going to take decades. It's going to be taking me decades. Uh, but if you're willing to work on it, it can happen. And if you're a Christian, I, when I became a Christian, I realized I'm going to have to engage people because my role as a Christian is to bring people who don't know them to faith in Christ. And, and how have you done fathering? Is it? It's been a struggle. Now, what's interesting about those of us in the spectrum, it's easy for us to relate to animals. Animals just seem to be drawn to me, and yeah. little children are drawn to mm. me. And it's because it's so easy to read the emotions of young children and animals. Really? Yeah. So when my boys were young, I had a great relationship with them. But when they got into their teenage years, that's when things really began to be a big so you're, struggle. You're a, you're a toddler whisperer. <laughs> it happens when I'm in an airport. Sometimes I'll see this frazzled lady with a bunch of kids, and here I am, a total stranger, but she trusts me to look after her kids while she takes care of things. And, and the kids are very comfortable with Now, you're a scientist. Uh, figure that one out. What, what, what is it? Is, is it some kind of a supra-rational sensitivity that people pick up? you know, in, in some kind of vibe, or, or, or is well, it? Well, the vibe is, this is a person I can trust. Huh. And so, and I've, I've talked to other people in the spectrum, they tell me similar stories about how they have a way with animals, because the animals realize this is someone I can trust. What counsel would you give to young parents who discovered or suspect that uh, their precious child may be autistic or maybe on the spectrum in some way? Well, they're going to have a gift where they can do things better than neurotypical people. And it's going to be different for everyone in the spectrum. None of us are the same. You need to find what that gift is. And what that, what, how you do that is you expose your child to advanced material in different areas. And you'll find something where it really clicks. Advanced material? Right. So what I tell people is, you know, if you've got a child who's on the spectrum, is high functioning, expose them to college level material and see what it is that really gets a spark. And when you find that, that's the direction you want to encourage uh, your child to develop. At the same time, you want to help them with the socialization. Realizing that uh, they can be socialized is going to take a lot of work. Mm. And particularly if the child has uh, got some level of humility, uh, they're willing to accept instruction and help. You know, adults are on the spectrum. That's what I tell them. 
you need to have the humility to be helped by people who are neurotypical to assist you in gaining the social skills you need. Does the message of Christ uh, have uh, an added dimension to it for someone who's on the spectrum? It does in the sense that I think it gives you the grace and the humility to be helped by neurotypical people. And recognize, I mean, what happened to me when I became a Christian is I realized I had to be an evangelist. And to be an evangelist, I had to develop better social skills. And it was my wife that really helped me develop those skills so that I could be more effective. You had to be. Like, you, I saw it as a command. You saw I it mean, as a command. I, uh, yeah, I became a Christian through reading a Gideon Bible seven yeah. years before I met a Christian and uh, realized that, hey, having read through the whole of the Bible, and see, my special gift of being on the spectrum, I'm able to integrate complex subjects across a wide spectrum and fit them all together. So seeing these 66 books, my passion in reading the Bible is how can I get these 66 books to seamlessly fit together? And having done that, I realized the message here is redemption and evangelism. Wow. Thanks, uh, Hugh. You're welcome.